Hi friends, greetings from India and thanks Richard and Lucho for having me in for this prestigious webinar on brown cataract situations. I am Arup Chakrabarti and I have no relevant financial disclosures. As per Richard's request, my talk is going to be video based and I have a series of minimally edited videos lined up for this presentation. Having tried out a number of techniques over the last 25 years, my current approach is to opt for techniques which are user-friendly, reproducible, less complication prone, and produce great long-term outcomes. Preoperative surgical planning plays a key role, and that includes nucleus disassembly strategy and proper control of the intraocular environment during surgery. Nucleus disassembly progresses through three stages, stage of debulking, dismantling into fragments, and fragment consumption. For a less hard nucleus, a surgeon may opt for direct chopping, bypassing the first stage of debulking. Let me start off with a typical case, a triangle with its apex towards the incision is sculpted, ensuring a deep central wall. The phaco tip is then buried into the nucleus, employing high vacuum setting through the deepest aspect of the wall and chopping is begun. The phaco tip is kept stationary and the chopper is manipulated appropriately to generate a full thickness peripheral cleavage line. The developing chop line is gradually extended centrally by employing step-by-step -step chop in situ. The nucleus is rotated 30 degrees for sequential chopping and this maneuver will be repeated till the entire nucleus is chopped into multiple fragments. Harder the nucleus, more the number of fragments. It may be necessary to apply an additional buzz of echo power for a deeper impalement of the tip for enhanced patches on the nucleus to prevent the nucleus from getting dislodged or disengaged from the phaco tip. I prefer to disassemble the nucleus completely before I start consuming the fragments. However, in certain situations, though not in this case, the first fragment may need to be consumed as soon as it is generated to create more space in the capsular bag for safer nuclear manipulations. Fragment consumption calls for different parameter settings and more of it later. FACO in this case is initiated with sculpting a short deep central groove. The FACO needle embeds at the deeper aspect of the distal wall with high vacuum settings. As there is a tendency for nucleus dislodgement, the needle is driven deeper into the nucleus with a further buzz of echo power. The nucleus is now well stabilized and chopping is easily done. The chop line is extended centrally by working at a deeper plane. The nucleus is sequentially rotated and the chopping sequence is repeated till the entire mass is split into multiple fragments. Feco parameter settings will be reset for fragment consumption at a later stage at lower vacuum and relatively higher aspiration flow rate. More caution should be exercised towards the end of fragment consumption to avoid post-occlusion surge, which may be dangerous for the posterior capsule. Before proceeding with trenching or chopping, it is useful to clean up the superficial leds matter as well as the OVD in front of the nucleus. A few OVDs like a viscote are thermogenic and can result in wound burns. In this case, the central groove is sculpted using 80% torsional phaco power and a balanced tip. The aspiration flow rate may need to be stepped up to facilitate rapid clearing of the lens milk generated 
during the sculpting maneuver. It is useful to shave the sidewalls of the groove for enhanced access of the FECO tip sleeve combo to the floor of the groove. This enables the FECO tip to reach the trench floor for further deepening. Once the trenching is deep enough, it is time to chop. The balanced tip is drilled into the distal wall of the groove, thereby pinning down the nucleus for it to be chopped. The chopper, after engaging with the nucleus surface, slices down towards the FECO tip and just before the two tips come together, they are moved apart, thereby creating a cleavage line which propagates towards the center. It is not necessary to struggle to have the cleavage line run all the way across to the opposite periphery at this stage itself. The nucleus is turned 30 degrees and fresh chopping is initiated. Whenever a tendency for nucleus tilt is noticed, the FECO tip is further driven into the nucleus with an additional burst of power without withdrawing the FECO tip. At the end of this stage, a little wedge of the nucleus is chiseled off from the main nuclear mass. The chopping is continued sequentially after further rotating the nucleus. Since the nucleus tended to tilt with an additional buzz, the FECO tip is driven deeper into the nucleus without breaking the hole so that the chopping can progress at a deeper plane. Care should be taken not to distort the capsular bag or stretch the rex's margin during the chopping maneuvers. The nuclear fragments are then consumed. It is desirable to have the nucleus downsized into multiple pieces. Harder and larger the nucleus, smaller the pieces. One has to guard against post-occlusion surge, though with the higher end machines, this is rare. The Sinsky hook in the left hand manipulates the fragments and guides them towards the FECO tip. Frequent dispersive OVD replenishment will keep the cornea clear on the first post-operative day. Throughout the surgery, just a Sinsky hook was used to manipulate the nucleus at various stages of nucleus disassembly. A deep central pit is sculpted with a mega tip, which is excellent for coring as well as holding. The nucleus is then fixated on the FECO tip with a high vacuum. Sinsky hook is used as the chopping device and a diagonal chopping is initiated. When the nucleus tends to rotate or shows impending dislodgement, the tip is driven deeper into the lens mass for effective chopping to occur. The vacuum also could be raised. The chopping is successful in the periphery from where it is propagated across the nucleus by employing step-by-step -step chop in situ. The nucleus has been chopped into two unequal portions, which is okay. Once the first chop is achieved, the subsequent chopping becomes easier to accomplish. The nucleus is rotated and chopped multiple times using the same principle. In this case, I would like to consume the fragments only towards the end of chopping. This strategy helps in preventing the capsular bag from collapsing and is a safety measure for the posterior capsule. Most of the manipulations happen at a deeper level, closer to the developing chop line. This prevents excessive lateral separation, which may jeopardize the capsular bag stability. One has to ensure that there is no uncoupling of the nucleus from the FECO tip during high vacuum chopping, which can result in disastrous post occlusion surge, compromising the posterior capsule integrity. The anterior chamber should be topped up with a dispersive OVD from time to time. The Sinsky hook used from the side port helps to control the free floating nuclear fragments. Surgeons should be careful while removing the final chunk of nucleus. The vacuum should be lowered. This is the stage where post-occlusion surge can result in a posterior capsular rent. This patient 
was an Anglo-Indian lady with bilateral black cataract. She successfully underwent FACO in both eyes. We will look at the video of the surgery in the first eye. The superficial lens matter along with the overlying OVD are removed to start with. A deep, rather long trench is sculpted. The torsional FACO cuts very efficiently and in really hard cataracts such as this one, as high as 80% torsional FACO power may be needed. Once the trench is deep enough, it is crucial in order to avoid recalcitrant issues with the posterior nuclear plate, a bimanual cracking is initiated from the periphery of the trench, since the cleavage is relatively easier to achieve at the peripheral location. Tendency for excessive lateral separation should be resisted, and the mechanical forces should be applied very close to the developing cleavage line at the bottom of the trench. If necessary, Additional lens matter may have to be shaved off from the floor of the deep groove. Cracking is initiated and as the crack line develops, the instrument tips are moved more proximally till the line of cleavage reaches sub area, thereby separating the nucleus into two halves. All these maneuvers are to be performed with a deep anterior chamber by repeated topping up with a dispersive OVD. Each of these two halves will now be chopped into multiple pieces. The parameter settings are now altered to match chopping requirements. The vacuum is raised and the power dropped proportionately. The number of chopped fragments is usually proportional to the degree of nuclear hardness as we have already discussed before. We don't want to be dealing with large nuclear chunks, especially in the setting of shallow anterior chambers or small rexis situations when the capsular, may, capsular bag may come under jeopardy. For fragment consumption, the vacuum is lowered a bit and the manipulations are performed within an environment of a dispersive OVD. The second instrument also plays a very important role in the movement of the fragments and keeping them away from the endothelium. All the maneuvers should be performed at a deeper plane away from the corneal endothelium. The surgeon should also be wary of small nuclear pieces which may go unnoticed only to show up embarrassingly in the post-operative period. One really has to be careful while removing the last chunk of the nucleus because this is the stage if the surgeon is not careful, post-occlusion surge may happen resulting in sudden shallowing of the anterior chamber and ballooning forward of the posterior capsule anteriorly resulting or which may result in damage to the posterior capsule. This patient did extremely well on the first postoperative day and had a sparkling cornea with a vision of 6 by 6. In addition to the surgical nuances highlighted in the videos, there are certain pearls gathered from experience which will stand the surgeon in good stead and these will hopefully be emphasized in the panel discussion. So friends, in conclusion, with proper attention to the intraocular environment following a logical nucleus disassembly protocol and application of the pearls of wisdom there is no reason why a hard brown cataract should not show a sparkling clear cornea on the first postoperative day.